You're listening to Today's Leaders, From Teens to Titans. Hi, I'm Lorraine Connell, a teen leadership coach. I transitioned from teaching chemistry to coaching teens in leadership, helping them realize they can do hard things. We've often believed that leadership is an innate trait, but it's actually a skill you build and improve. On this show, you'll meet today's leaders who share their teenage experiences, revealing how they've developed confidence, direction, and the tools to become the leaders they are now. You'll discover how you or the teens in your life have the potential to be confident leaders, even if it doesn't seem possible today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Leaders of Today, Teens to Titans. Today, we have a special guest joining us, Abby Sangmeister, who brings a wealth of experience in working on mental health challenges with teens and adolescents. We will be diving into where her drive to work with teens and adults around burnout developed. I'm incredibly excited to hear Abby's insights on these important subjects. So without further ado, let's jump into our conversation. Welcome, Abby. So glad to have you today. Oh my gosh, thank you so much because it's such an important topic that it doesn't get enough attention. Yeah, and as a teen leadership coach, I recognize that our teens are, well, if they're coming to me, then maybe that's because somebody told them that they need to have this, 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 and this all part of their resume. But I want to empower them to see themselves as leaders already without that laundry list of things on their resume. And that's often the biggest hurdle. They don't know that they're leaders and they feel like the only way to be a leader is to have that laundry list. So can you describe the person or the people that you work with, the teens that you work with, or you as a teen, and what experiences shaped you into the leader Mm -hmm. that you are today? Yeah, so I think a lot of teens that I've worked with are feeling anxious, and they feel like you said, they're not doing enough, and they don't know what else they want to stand out sometimes, or they want to get better at something. So they are just doing more and more and more. And that is counterproductive, because a lot of times they're just turning their wheels And they're not moving the needle forward because they're just doing so much that they need more time of reflection or downtime to rest and recharge. And then they can really focus and move forward. And I think there's there's like this middle range of teens that don't go acknowledged either. Like you have like, you know, the kids where are having some school challenges and then you have like the highly driven, you know, A, honors, taking all the AP classes. And then there's those other kids, which was me. And I never knew I was a high achiever or a type A personality because I am messy, messy, messy. (laughs) I am disorganized, but I know that organization. And I got A's. Like I didn't have to, for some classes, study. I just was like, I'm going to, you know, just skate by. Yeah, I could have probably taken some more high level classes and pushed, but I also was like, I don't... (laughs) I don't want to do some of that. And there's a part of me that wishes someone would have pushed me, but I didn't enjoy school. I didn't enjoy like some of the way school was set up. And there weren't choices when I was in school for like other options of virtual school or homeschooling. That just wasn't something that ever came across. But like you said, the laundry list, like I knew I needed to be on certain sports teams. I was a competitive swimmer, which I loved. I was on multiple swim teams. And I had to swim for my high school team, even though I didn't want to, because I was on a more highly competitive team. But swimming for your high school team would look better. Um, Plus, the school would let me leave for swim meets more easily if I was on both teams. And joining clubs and choosing like what club to do, how to fit that into my schedule. Then I wanted to work to make money. At one point, I was too young to make money. So I'd work because I knew that would look good on my resume for college. And I was like trying to build what would look good to get into school without really even understanding like the why behind it. Mm. Wow. Mic drop right there. Not understanding the why behind it. And the why for all of our kids that were experiencing this burnout or this over commitment mm-hmm. is I need it for college. 
But if we dig a little bit deeper into that question, why do you need it for college? What is it you're going to college Mm -hmm. for? What is it your aim is? And so I guess that is my question for you is, how did you know or did you know what you wanted to do and what you're doing right now? Were they the same thing when you were 17 years old and filling that list of things that you needed to get on that resume? So I, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a therapist. And then I got to undergrad and that changed. And then I became a therapist. So I think the important thing is like your journey is not going to be a direct line. And I think as kids and also parents of kids, we're like, how can we get on that direct line the fastest way and get them to like this end destination of, we'll use me for an example, to be a therapist. And like, you're supposed to quote unquote, finish high school, go to college, get your master's degree, you know, have a job, get married, have kids, like all within this time span. And I work with late 20 year olds who are not on that projection and they feel awful about themselves. And so they end up in maybe careers that they didn't want to be in because they haven't had time to reflect because they're just doing, you know, checking off the boxes. They don't enjoy the, the college experience or even the high school experience. You know, you're hanging out with friends maybe, but you're hanging out with friends at, you know, for me, like on my swim team there, I wasn't hanging out on the weekends because I was doing all of the other things. You know, I was on multiple swim teams. I was working and you see a lot of kids who are doing the same thing that they don't have that downtime or to socialize in a very relaxed setting. And that just continues until at some point in their adulthood, they burn themselves out, which could look like mental health challenges, physical challenges, relationship challenges. So it really like spans the whole person. It's that the hamster wheel, right? So, so you're on this hamster wheel, you're not having an opportunity to reflect. And I have decided, you know, I want to get to those teens before their junior year in Mm -hmm. high school, because I think that's where the burnout shift really sets in. And Mm -hmm. I want kids to know that it's okay to make mistakes. Like you said, Mm -hmm. it's not a linear path. I would challenge any adult to say, maybe doctors and lawyers, you know, like, was this a linear path for you? Because, or the question is, do you think that we feel like life is so short that we have to get there faster? As parents, we're pushing our kids to make a decision to decide where they're going, what they're going to do at 16, 17, maybe 18 years old. And if you said, if they don't know at that point, they're considered a mistake, a failure, they're not doing the right thing. And so how do we, how do we support? What do we change? What is your, what's your guidance? Well, I think because I work with so many adults too, some that are retired and they're like, I wish I could have whatever, a different career. And I'm like, well, why didn't you? And it was like that fear of making a change. Like I already set this in my path in progress. I couldn't deviate from it or they waited till retirement to do things that they enjoy. And now they're not as physically capable to do some of those things. So it's like, how do you find that balance? And I think for teens, they might think they know a career. And there's lots of people who definitely know what their career is. Like, I'm glad I took the risk and I went and studied abroad, which took me out of my element. I could no longer compete on the swim team for a year. What was that going to look like? I loved swimming, but what was that going to look like? And how was I going to then pick up a minor? And it was going to change my whole schooling. But I was like, I have the opportunity to go live in Florence, Italy and go. It was worth it to have other experiences. And I think in high school, We don't bring in enough experience. We only know who we know around us and what their parents do or what maybe school is telling us. And there's so many different careers out there or ways to get there. We're taking, you know, like leap years to figure it out or not even going, you know, you don't have to go to college. There's so many trades that are amazing and you don't have to fit this mold that I think at least my generation was fed like this, you have to go to college. And we know there's so many amazing other careers that doesn't take a college course. How do we as teens Mm -hmm. and parents of teens know that our kids need help? And how do we support them? 
So I think one of your, if they're thinking of coming to work with you, whether it's the parent or the teen and they've, they're on board to work with you there, they asked for help. Maybe it wasn't like a direct line of asking, but they're invested some way. When teens come to see me for therapy, sometimes they're forced, sometimes they've asked. And I asked that question and you just asked, I'm like, what do you want to get out of this? Sure. Mm-hmm. Your caregiver, your parent wants you to come here because you're angry or they think you're depressed, but your parents not in the room. What do you want to get out of this time together? Whatever you want. We could talk about art. We could talk about football. Like, and that's kind of my lead in. And then what do you need help with? And it's building that rapport. That's really important too. And I think the other piece is when parents and teachers are open about their own experiences and you don't have to go into very detailed private parts, but you could, you know, if you got help in the past or if you've been challenged by things, maybe you've worked with a leadership coach or a therapist at some point or a school counselor, sharing those stories is really important. And for teens who might not have that kind of role model, I'll bring up some athletes that seek help. But like, if they're like into football, I'm like, oh my gosh, yes, I've read that this football And if I don't know at that time, I research it later and give an example. Oh, this basketball player, this actor did this or whatever. You know, if they're into engineers, like I try and find someone that they can relate to or that they're into to say like, it's okay to ask for help. It helps you get to the next level. That's awesome. I I love how you connect it to something that they're interested in and let them know that it's not just them. Because I do Mm -hmm. think often... As teens, they feel so isolated. And I know I felt really isolated, like I was the only one experiencing this. So I guess then my question to you is, how did you know that you were reaching a limit for yourself? And what are some signs that we can look for in our teens that are going towards burnout? Looking back, I knew as a teen that No, I didn't love school. I did not like school. And I knew I had to go to college. And I didn't want to go to college. And everyone's like, it's going to be different. And it was because I could pick later classes. (laughs) That was a big thing. And I had more choice in what classes I could be in. And I didn't enjoy being, I was shy and introverted. But I would be picked to kind of be a leader because I got a great grade in a class. So they would want me to like help you know, they'd put someone who was struggling in the class and I'd be in a group project with them. And I didn't enjoy any of that. I think looking for the students who are kind of like in that in between, and you might not know. And I think creating that language of what different feelings are, just because I was overwhelmed with all that I was doing. I didn't know it at the time. My mom was great because she would give us mental health days. You know, if my grades were good and I used to swim at Lehigh University late at night, on a a swim team. And uh, she'd be like, were your grades good? You know, how are you doing in school? She'd be like, I'll get you a doctor's note. You can stay home tomorrow, but you have to make sure you get your homework done. You can't sleep all day. The dishes have to be out of the dishwasher type of thing, but you need to rest. Or she'd like take us to lunch, you know, every so often as like these little mental health moments. I didn't know I hit burnout until I was in my twenties, thirties. I can't remember how old I was. I'd have to look it up. And then like physically my body was like, Nope. You keep trying to do all of the things and doing all of the things that were healthy, like working out and eating well and like having fun on the weekends and having a career that I loved. And I still burned myself out because I was doing it all and not taking time. Yeah, that's the mind blowing piece, right? So you're doing all the things that are right. And that's what I see when teens come to me and they've got this list of things that they're doing, but they're like, but I don't know what, what is leadership? Like I've got this title and I've got this and I've got that, but, but where is my leadership? And so that's what I think is really fascinating is that you were doing all the right things that you thought you were supposed to be doing. And it wasn't until your body said, stop. Mm -hmm. And I think that happens more often than not that people get physically ill. You know, I had a client who broke their ankle so bad because they slept walk because they were so stressed out. You know, I've had other clients with other ailments or their relationships fail. You know, they burn friendships, other partnerships, and they don't understand why they're not feeling connected, not connected with themselves either. 
you know, and again, you're checking off the box. I was like eating healthy, check, going to them, check, go. I was in therapy, going to therapy, check, did it like all the things I didn't check off the box of like, just chill, you know, just, you know, rest. I was getting sleep, check, eight hours of sleep. Sure. Well, maybe not eight hours, you know, like checking off all the boxes, but I wasn't ever really fully recharging that battery or allowing myself to just have time to reflect on like, am I enjoying the activities that I'm doing? Kids who Mm -hmm. are not in clubs, kids who are not in athletics, how do we help them find mentors? Or was there a coach or mentor that you had that allowed you to see how valuable having a coach is? I think of some of my swim coaches and there was no way I would go to them and they would just push me, push you to do more. I think if there's other people in their lives, if there's like an aunt, an uncle, like, you know, like a friend, a parent that they connected with, there might even be, you know, I think of some kids who play certain video games and they're connected with someone out there, you know, that feels like a support. Again, like our peers sometimes are not the best support, but they can kind of encourage us to say like, hey, you are struggling. I think teens encouraging each other to say, this is not working for you is really important. And I have to say, I do see that with some teens where they will have those conversations to each other. The point that we need to do is have the teens then say like, I hear you. I hear that you're feeling stressed and anxious and depressed. Let's find you someone else to talk to. I think that's something that's really important. That might be the piece that's missing. But I think connecting with teens is really important. Listen to them, spend time with them, have like once a week, or once a month, go out to like breakfast or dinner with them. One of the best tricks is whoever the adult is, keep your phone in the car, you don't touch it. The kid might pick it up. Okay. But you're there, you're present, and it's going to take some time. And sooner or later, that kid's going to start talking to you. But as long as they know you're present, and that phone is nowhere in reach, another room somewhere else, leave it in the car is a great way. Another great thing to do with teens to get them talking is going for a walk with them. Again, phone away leave it at home, put it in your pocket where you're not going to touch it. If you have like a watch that bangs, take that off. Don't look at that because they're aware of all of that. And they want to know that you're present and just walk and don't ask questions. Just walk. They'll start talking. As you first started, you said that your coaches really pushed you. And it made me think about their role in your trajectory, right? So you were a good swimmer. They saw good things in you. They pushed you really hard. You saw good things in yourself. You pushed yourself really hard. I think there's definitely a correlation. And so how do we protect our teens from falling into that cycle, right? So we've got it from mom and dad saying, you need to have this list. We've got it from the teachers and the counselors in our school saying, you've got to have this list. And we've got it from our coaches How do teens protect themselves from that burden and that pressure that's being put on them? That's a good question. And I want to say like some kids might not even have the school because I've worked with kids that don't have parents that are pushing them for grades or in the Mm -hmm. sports, but they just internally want to be on like Dean's list. And like the parents like, you don't need to be on Dean's list. Like, I just want you to be happy, but I'm not going to be happy unless I have I'm on Dean's list or from top. And I think it's like honoring that, but how can you find that balance? You can still get on Dean's list and relax on the couch on a Sunday or go for a walk in the woods and not study. You can still get there. And so I think it's just more role models who are doing that or have done that. And I think we're hearing more about people who are finding their way in different paths and still being successful without that hustle mentality. And so showing them who those people are as role models. Yeah. And when we first started talking, you sort of described that a lot of times teens come to you with mental health challenges and the Mm -hmm. source of those mental health challenges are burnout. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how it goes from being a mental health diagnosis or a challenge to, well, here are the things that you can do to alleviate that. And then. Yeah. So, I mean, the biggest one I would say is anxiety. And sometimes you have like that test anxiety, anxiety and depression. 
and thinking they're not good enough. And so once you kind of dive into that and you're like, okay, where, like, where is this all coming from? This test anxiety, like you're getting A's, you know, like you're getting a 90 and it still wasn't this good enough. And so diving into like where that good enough is coming from and knowing that when we are constantly moving, we don't rest. So sometimes I think about it like your phone, like you have to stop and charge your phone. The more that you play on your phone while it's charging, the longer it takes to charge. We have to stop and take a moment and then we can see more and reflect more. And once it's really hard for the kids that have that checklist and I add the checklist in there, I'm like, okay, we're going to add, we're going to start with five minutes, like nothing time, you know, and, and nothing time could be like journaling or reading a book for enjoyment. You know, we can come up with some other things, maybe like playing an instrument, but not to like just to play, you know? And another thing is tapping into like giving them Play-Doh. I love like giving them Play-Doh or like they're going to color in session with me. Something that's childlike and fun to tap into like just being playful instead of like serious and driven all the time and slowly like reflect on how does that feel and moving towards that. Oh, you took five minutes to sit and color in like the little mermaid or superhero coloring book. How did that feel? Well, awkward at first. And then like, as they do that more and more, it feels good. And it doesn't have to be, you know, a full day of doing nothing, just creating these moments where their brain can rest, their body can rest and recharge. Good enough. I carried that all the way through probably within the last five years, have I realized that my perfectionism, my drive was all because I didn't think I was good enough. And Mm -hmm. I had to, I just start affirmations, right? I am good enough. Mm -hmm. I'm worthy. I am special, right? And those are the things that I never said in my head. Yeah. And I don't think many of our teens say those kind, heartfelt affirmations what a difference that might make at 16, 15, 14 versus 40 plus. <laughs> it's a lot more time to like try and get that affirmation working. And I think as, you know, parents and teachers saying those words, mm. I think we think we say them or we think yes. them, but we don't say you're doing a good job. And just like a random day, like you're doing, just so you know, you're doing a great job. Not because you aced a test, not because you came in first place. Just like, hey, I woke up this morning thinking like, you're an amazing kid and you're doing a great job. Imagine how powerful that is. As an adult, if you're listening, like imagine if someone just said that to you right now, which anyone that's listening, oh my God, anyone that's listening, like there's a reason why they're listening. And so they should be proud of themselves of like, they want to make a change. So you're good enough. You're doing a great job. And like, tell yourself that I'm telling you, Maureen's going to tell you. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is I couldn't say that thing to myself. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if I can't say it to myself, I'm not going to say it to other people. And if I can't say it to other people, then the people in my life, the ones that I love most dearly are not Mm -hmm. hearing that message and they're going to carry on that. I'm not good enough message. And so, yeah, What Abby just said, say it to yourself right now in your head. I am good enough. What I am doing Mm -hmm. is amazing and good. And Mm -hmm. I don't need to be any better. I am who I am because I have who I am. And like, I will tell you that practicing gratitude and starting to say those affirmations, I realized that that voice in my head would actually be quiet. I didn't know Mm -hmm. that it was possible for the voice in my head to turn off. I would love for you to sort of share a little bit about how peers and teens are really the adults' first responders. I, as a teacher, I wanted to give them the confidence, the ability to know that when somebody came to them with those three major issues, that they knew what to do. And Mm -hmm. I often would be met with, we can't, we can't give our kids those tools because then they're in a position of vulnerability. And it was like, from my perspective, they already were, but we weren't giving them their tools. What are your thoughts about that? I always say like, well, what if something happens 
how would that, how would your student feel? How would your child feel? Like that heaviness to carry with you for the rest of your life, you know, is a lot heavier than, you know, like maybe someone getting upset with you for, for a moment or whatever, however long it might be longer than a moment. So yeah, encouraging them and starting young with those conversations. I know people are hesitant. Kids already know what's going on. They hear what's going on. They know more than, than we think they know. So by talking about it earlier in their life, you know, who to go to for help, like, if the first person and the other piece, sometimes it's like the first person adult they go to for help might not take it seriously, you know, and that's, you know, like that happens. That's okay. But keep going, like be loud about this. It's really important. There is the right person who is going to listen to you and you will find that. Yeah. I think that's such an important thing for people to hear is that the first person you go to may not listen. They may not be interested. They may be too busy. It doesn't mean what you have to say isn't important. You just have to find somebody else and you're right. Be loud. Yeah. Yeah. Because that person, like that adult could have their own, you know, triggers or we don't know, they might not know the answer. So they don't know what to do. And their response is to get quiet and not do anything. But there is that adult out there that will will help and support you. And I think that all adults at some point or another, we've been in that position where we're like, that information is so much and too much. I don't know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. And our go-to, like many of the teens, is to pretend we didn't hear it or pretend there, there's nothing we can do anyway. So why mm-hmm. would it matter for me to hear that? And yeah. yeah. So knowing that that is a a situation that can happen Mm -hmm. empowers them to know, keep saying it, keep talking, go to someone else. I think of a young man who I interviewed who shared that he was bullied as a child and, you know, the dismissiveness when he told the adults in his world and, Mm -hmm. and how much that made him second guess what he was hearing because mm-hmm. they were adults. And it's really important to know we can all make mistakes. Now, a lot of people, unfortunately, don't know what to do with the bullying. And it's mm-hmm. huge. Unfortunately, there's so much of it going on, and it's not okay. And I think not that this is okay, but parents and teachers don't have the answers to how to fix it. I know there's a school like in middle, there's a middle school near me that's having a huge problem with it. And they don't know the answers. They don't know how to fix it. You know, they're trying different tools and strategies. And it's just, it's consuming the students. But the one thing that they're doing is they're still working on it. And they're talking about it. They're talking about it all the time. Like, how can we fix this? How can we move a student out of this situation for now until we can find an answer or move the the person that's bullying them out of the situation? How can we have, you know, we're thinking teens, but how can we have more line of sight on them right now until we can find better solutions for a specific situation? And it's not always easy. The solutions for those are not always easy. And someone's, it's not going to be convenient. It's not going to be like feeling fair, but we have to make sure that, that all the students involved are safe. That's and heard. That's what I find often we forget is that the students have a voice and Mm -hmm. hence the reason why I created the first two seasons of this podcast is kids often have the answers we're looking for. So Mm -hmm. I hope, I don't know if you have a connection, but my recommendation for that school is to engage directly with Mm -hmm. all the students and see what solutions that they have because simply they're in it. They know it. Mm-hmm. And so they're usually, yeah. like I said, the first responders, they know they have ideas of solutions. And yeah, so often I have found that their solutions don't often cost too much money. And so it's really, really, really cool. I would love for you to share how maybe you defined success as a teen and how that maybe that definition of success took you down the path of burnout and what could you have done differently to 
avert the burnout that you experienced? I mean, I wanted to have like this huge house and it was very much money related, you know, huge mansion, like drove past them, like where I live. It was about that. It was like really about money, maybe title. I wasn't so aware of like a title. You know, there's part of me and still there's a part of me that I just want to have the doctor title and it's superficial. I'd be doing the exact same. I'd be making the same amount of money, but it would just be cool to be like Dr. Abby, right? But when I like weigh it out, I'm like, I'm doing the same thing. I have all of the same knowledge, you know, it would just be more training and it would be more stuff that, you know, I've already done. So like a lot of it is the superficial piece. And I remember a few years ago, I I can tell you where I was. I can tell you what I was wearing. I can see it so vividly. I had, I was walking my dog right before I go to work. I live at the beach. Now I live in a very small three bedroom condo. But I create my schedule how I want to. I have my own private practice, which is something I did want. And I was walking my dog and I had like shorts on and like a tank top before I go to work with like my swimsuit on underneath because I just got done paddle boarding in the ocean. And I just remember being like, God, I love my life. Like this is what I've always dreamed of. And again, like I have a very small home now. I, you know, like, I'm not buying all of the fancy clothes anymore. Like that's not the the designer labels and stuff like that's not important to me. What's important is that I feel content and I feel joy at some point of my day, every day. I feel like I can breathe. It's not about the dollars in my bank account because sometimes there's still struggle. And I just remember that like I was like living this life that I never thought. It wasn't even something I dreamed of as a teen. It was something that didn't even seem like maybe reality. But as I got older, I was like, this is what feels good to me. I need to be by the ocean. That's really important to me. Success to me is that feeling content, happiness. I'm not feeling, you know, overwhelmed or stressed most days. I know when I'm feeling overwhelmed and stressed, there's a reason for it. And I know how to handle whatever is coming my way where there's been points in my life that the smallest thing um, just would feel so heavy and that I couldn't see through it or around it. And now I know like if there's a challenge that comes, I'll be able to figure it out. You know, but when you're burned out, it's, you know, something small just like feels like it, everything's crumbling. And so I really, that's success. Success is just feeling great and calm each day, you know, and you don't have to be locked in a career at any age. You know, if you have listeners who are like in their 40s and 50s, like you can change careers. I've helped plenty of adults change careers. And teens, if you're deciding you want a career and you're in college and you're like, nope, I want to change it you can change it. It's okay. Someone might be like, oh my God, but all your school loans, you'll figure it out. Like, it'll be fine. Like, it's more important for you to feel calm and grounded every day. That's success. For our teens, they don't have enough life experience to know what success really is. And so I think it's part of the challenge as a teen, defining success or defining what leadership Mm -hmm. is, is so narrow and so limited. Mm -hmm. So tell us, Abby, how can people work with you? Who are you looking to work with and where can they find you? Yeah. Yeah. So I live in New Jersey, so I provide therapy virtual therapy to anyone in New Jersey. Um, But I also provide burnout coaching throughout the US and even international. I've had international clients. So they can always find me on evolvingwhole.com or on Instagram at evolvingwhole. If you are not sure if coaching or therapy, you're not, you're like, I have no idea which is right for me. Like I offer consultation calls to help figure out what is the best fit for you. And if we are not a good fit, I have a network of professionals that I will link you to or resources to link you to because I think it's so important for us to find the right fit to make changes in our teens and in our lives. I love all of the stuff that you shared today. So thank you so, so much. Absolutely. I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing. It's so important. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Leaders of Today, Teens to Titans. If you found this episode helpful, please subscribe, leave a review, and share it with other parents who might benefit from this conversation. Together, we can support our teens in building healthy, positive relationships and become leaders of tomorrow. 
Until next time, I'm Lorraine Connell, and this is Leaders of Today, Teens to Titans.